Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the laboratory meeting. Uh, today is Thursday. If we all forget what day it is, I'm sometimes that person. My name is April. I'm a member of the LINK team. You see some guidelines on the screen there. As a reminder, the audience will remain muted. You can submit questions into the Q&A, and we have been addressing those as the topics have been discussed. Committee members should be promoted to panelists. If you raise your hand, we can handle that for you. That allows you to mute and unmute and engage in the discussion. Um, at this point, I will stop sharing and I'll turn the floor over to Pam Banning, who will kick off this meeting for us. Thank you, April. Good afternoon, good morning um, to everyone. Or we're so glad that so many people are joining in to attend the virtual LabLink conference. Um, if you, uh, if this is your first time to coming to the public meeting, um, welcome very much. We are always looking for other people uh, with other perspectives to join us on the committee. I'm going to put in the chat box just the link for the um, the small amount of administration time it, uh, work it takes to become a committee member. Uh, you'll see when you go out to that link that there are a variety of uh, subcommittees underneath clinical um, and so that's about all I can think of I did hear that Clem McDonald is coming on then Clem would you like to say anything before we start this time block Clem has actually not arrived yet all right uh, so if you want to go ahead and get started and as soon as he comes on we'll put him in as a panelist all right so this this time block will just go I believe about two hours and 15 minutes I'm not doing math very well right now. Uh, two, yep, two hours and 15 minutes. Um, and the, the committee and the Reagan Streif team have come together with a, a, a pretty good set of discussion topics. Um, so very first on the agenda, uh, if you go out to the virtual schedule, you'll be able to see the items in which we will be discussing. So Swapna Abiyankar will be doing allergy panels first, and then David Biorto will be talking about the unknown specimen. I'll turn the time over to Swapna. Great, uh, thanks Pam. And I think actually Clem's just joining. I just saw his name pop up. And he has a couple of topics later. I know he has to leave a little bit early, so I actually wanted to see if he wanted to go earlier in the agenda, maybe not this moment uh, because, because he just joined. But um, anyway, Clem, are you on? Um, okay, maybe I will go ahead with the allergy topic and then we can, um, we can figure out whether to shuffle around the agenda a little bit afterwards. Um, and I, I still can't share my video, so apologies for that, but I can share my screen. So I will do that. Oops. Okay, yes, got that. And you should be seeing. I am on, uh, I just couldn't get my machine to work right. Oh, okay, hi, welcome. But, uh, but I don't need to share the screen. I don't have screen stuff, I got talking. Okay, all right, well, I'm just gonna start with the allergy yeah, panels sure. topic. I, I mean, I don't only have to leave 15 minutes early, so I, I'm here. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, all right, can everybody see uh, the Word document with uh, the heading link allergy panels? Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, okay, and so uh, I guess we'll just jump in. So the first topic is about link allergy panels and really sort of what to do with them and how to move forward with them. And so just a little bit of background first. Um, in general, blank allergy panels are used for ordering multiple allergen tests as a single package, and then each allergen would be resulted separately. Um, that's a little bit different from all of the multi-disc combination testing terms that we have in Blank, where basically there's a whole bunch of allergens that are tested together, and then if any of them um, you know, if there are antibodies to any of them, then the result is positive, but the multi-disc ones don't actually distinguish between the allergens. The panels are actually tests just like, you know, CBC or a basic metabolic panel where there's multiple tests that are done, um, you know, for that particular allergen category. And so I just have some examples here uh, just to compare. The first long term is one of those multi-disc ones where it's food allergen mix one and uh, you can't tell the difference between peanut, brazil nut, coconut, hazelnut, and almond. 
uh, in the result. If it's positive, then you know the person is allergic to one of those things, but you don't know which one and you have to do further testing. And that's versus uh, this food allergen panel where there's multiple different components. And it, let me just pause there. Is this big enough? Can people see it? Yes. Okay, excellent. So each of these would be <coughs> resulted separately, basically. Um, you know, so egg, peanut, wheat, walnut, etc. cetera. Um, almost all of the LOINC allergy panels were created many years ago before 2010 and contain very specific sets of required allergens based on the panels, uh, essentially based on one manufacturer's panels that were available in the US at the time. And you can actually see that here in this food allergen panel, these little Rs, that basically means that this element is required. And so for this panel, um, you know, all of these individual tests would have to be run and reported. Um, here's a couple more panels. We have actually most of the panels that we have are for respiratory allergens for different regions of the US and they're very, very specific. So there's, um, you know, inland Northwest A and there's US Hawaii um, and they each have, you know, a very specific set of uh, children with the very, you know, required optional, um, well, mainly just required and optional. But uh, you can see, you know, they're not super flexible. And so if you have a similar panel um, that you're running in your lab, you can only use this one if you're including all of the required components. And so over time, we've gotten requests for new panels um, that are, you know, specific for different regions or manufacturers or labs. But so far, we actually haven't created such panels because they're just really difficult to maintain. Uh, but we also didn't, you know, we hadn't really proposed any alternate solutions. And so we're revisiting that because recently we had another uh, request for specific allergy panels and we've been uh, giving that a little bit of thought recently. So the main issues with the way, you know, we're currently representing allergy panels in LOINC is one, there's very little representation of non-US or you know, practically none of non-US regional allergen panels. And then the panels that we have for things like food and nuts and respiratory allergens that are not region specific, those, uh, you know, they, again, they contain a very specific set of uh, child elements based on um, the request that we got back, you know, before 2010, but different labs do different testing. And so you can see even, you know, I just have three examples from three big US labs. All three of them in their nut panel or nut profile are looking at different nuts. There's certainly some overlap, but there's quite a bit of, you know, um, non-overlap as well and unique elements in each one. <clears throat> And then um, in terms of the region specific panels, each individual manufacturer actually can have a lot of them. And so recently I was looking at the Euroimmune site and they have more than 30 region specific panels just for uh, respiratory allergens. And so you can imagine the number of panels, you know, becomes quite large uh, over time and they change as well. So I don't actually know all these panels that were created for the regional US respiratory allergens. I don't know if those exact same panels are still run or if they've changed, um, in which case we don't have a great way of maintaining them. So that brings me to my proposal. So my proposal is that for um, the categorical panels like food allergen, nut allergen, and core respiratory allergens, that we actually take off the panel children to create what we call naked panels in LOINC, which basically are panels with no children, but which allow the same panel code to be used for the same order across labs, but then, you know, whichever specific tests are done in that individual lab, those LOINCs would be used to report the results. And so for the food allergen panel, or, or sorry, let me go back to the nut allergen panel, you know, if I was running the, um, the panel at LabCorp, I would use the LOINC codes for almond, Brazil nut, cashew nut, hazelnut, peanut, pecan, and walnut for the results. But if I was at Mayo, I would use the ones for almond, coconut, peanut, pecan, and sesame seed. Um, but that way, the same order code could be used uh, by all of the labs to order the nut allergen or nut profile. Um, and then the second part of it is that for new requests for region-specific panels, 
um, I propose creating region specific uh, naked panels. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, so, you know, Southeast Asia or, you know, all of the various um, ones that Euroimmune actually has very specific ones even within the regions. But I think my proposal would be to create them at a, you know, slightly more general level, um, but still have them specific for the region itself. And then finally, in the future, um, you know, as we have time, and as I mentioned on Tuesday, our, our team is growing. So, you know, maybe this will happen sooner rather than later. But for all of the existing region specific panels, I think we really need to review whether what we have in the panel right now actually matches what's currently being performed um, across manufacturers and laboratories. And if the differences are minimal, we could update the panels. But if the changes are, you know, um, quite large, then I would propose turning all of these into naked panels as well. And you can see um, all of the different ones that we have and they're quite specific. <clears throat> so that's it. So I'm gonna open it up for discuss discussion and potential decision. And I can go back to any parts of this if people want. Okay. And Andrea had a comment on online. Um, yeah, so this is Jamie. She said, would it be an option to list the individual results that the labs are doing and making their status as optional or optional like, like other panels? It would help mappers to understand the differences. So we could, but basically it would be very difficult to maintain. Um, and so, it, you know, basically labs would have to let us know if they added a particular element, like we could make, let's say for the nut panel um, or the food allergen panel, you know, we could at this moment in time add all of the elements across at least some representation of the major labs. But I think it would be hard for us to know that we're covering everything. And when they're updated, you know, if we would have to be told that. Um, and that's why it's easier to have the naked panels so that people, you know, can just use the appropriate elements without, I, I feel like sometimes if there's a panel that's close in LOINC, but not exactly right, you know, people, that you can't use it correctly, then that's correct. Um, but it just, you know, it makes it a little bit more confusing. I think if you see something that's close, but you, you know, it's not really right. But then if you just see something that says, use whichever elements are, you know, appropriate in your situation that are specific to food allergy, then um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, personally, so, I think that makes it easier. Uh -huh. So I haven't had another thought. So you know, clearly you can't keep you know, managing every panel exactly as people do it. But I think in terms of information, we are dropping a lot of information to users. And what about example content like we do with answer lists? Because people won't know what these panels are without examples, just like answer lists for questions. Yeah, uh, you know, and, and I've been thinking about that. And, you know, we can certainly put information in the term description about, you know, example link terms that would be reported with this panel include and then list some. We just don't have a mechanism right now for saying these, you know, let's say we have six things in the nut panel for saying this is just an example. And I think when people see that list and they see the panel structure, they, you know, they don't see that as examples. They just see that as what it should be. Back in 2000. Oh, sorry, Clem. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was just going to say back in 2014 or so when we were doing the um, ALOINC order code discussions uh -huh. um, and we had several months of meetings on that, there was conversation that any laboratory or clinician's office enters some sort of a uh, kind of a contract with, their, with the local labs, at which point they're given dis, um, catalogs or compendiums from the labs of service in which those things are already listed. Um, and so it might it might be simplistic to just add a comment in the description to check with the local lab provider and assure that um, that that the mapper knows what is what is what they're linking up to. Um, actually, so that would be for if it was if it was to a send out lab, and actually then the send out lab is providing the the link order code. Um, so we, that might even become null. This might only just be a conversation for those labs that are uh, maybe regional labs that are creating their own allergy panels to offer to their communities. 
but having just having a sentence in there that in the description that mm -hmm. um, that this this is open enough to reflect whatever your local compendium is offering in the way of food allergens or nut allergens. Well, the problem I have is, are you still saying naked, Pam? I am, yeah. because I just don't want to put the burden of uh, of maintenance on this on anyone, especially for an international vocabulary standard. That's a lot of maintenance. Well, not if you if you can just declare these are examples, because people won't know when to think their thing belongs to this category. I'm afraid if they don't have some examples. Right. You know, the, the nuts would be easy. I mean, you, I mean, you could take either the intersection or the union of them to start and say it's example. They'll be added or, or reduced. Uh, but that may still be work. That still may be work. But without examples, it's hard to know what it is. Yeah. So potentially we could. Right. So maybe take off. Yeah. Like a regional. You know, are they really that much different? Uh, I, yeah. Trees and grasses are yes. Yep. Well, well, I mean that gives you some idea of what, but but it would have to create this new critter. But it's a lot like answer lists. The reason why answer lists are important is because sometimes questions are just not clear without knowing what the answer possibilities are. And I think it'd be similar, but still, so maybe the you'd have the least amount of work with naked ones. Right. But then you're actually throwing away a lot of information you already have. The, yeah, you know. that's true. So maybe the um, maybe the better thing to do would be at least, and there's actually only three of these generic ones, the food, the nut, and the core respiratory. So maybe just taking off the required, adding information about, you know, checking with the, you know, with the local. Um, well, well, and I think I declare their examples in a way because you can't, you, you just said you don't know for sure if they have added or removed stuff. Right. And uh, right. I mean, I think we'd have to say in the term description, because right now we have no other mechanism for saying this is an example panel. And we, you know, I don't think that's something that we can build in the near future. Well, well what about in the required optional and EX? I mean, it's not, they're not there now, but. I uh, think it's probably better just to leave it off leave off the required optional conditional rather than create a new. Oh, okay. We, yeah. have, we have a couple Stop. of questions online. Okay. Um, so uh, if the panels are naked and any result can be used, what is the utility of having region naked panels? Isn't that in essence adding another axis to the link code location of lab or facility performing the test? Well, I guess the benefit is then you have the order code. And so if you know that you're, you know, you're in the Northeast US and you want a Northeast US respiratory allergen profile, then you would have the order code for that. And then each lab, if they have, you know, 10 components or 12 components would use the proper um, resulting elements. Yeah, it signals what allergies will be tested in right. that collection, in that panel. And it's not always regional. I mean, like nut allergy is not a it might be, but I mean, you know, it's it's a category. <clears throat> um, and then John Snyder's um, stated that the only place I see this creating a challenge is when a resulting lab is returning a PDF report and returning the panel code as the resulting LOINC code for that report. I don't think the LOINC can be responsible for to solve this problem. And he also agrees that we do need to keep the region specificity in the component. Or I don't think term. I've ever seen the mnemonic of a code go back on a patient, on a client report. It's usually like our, our version of the long common name. You know, the lab will have a, a display name, a chart name, a print name. <clears throat> and I don't, I've never been a proponent of having the LOINC codes on the foreground, on the chart. Why not? It would help with mapping errors. <clears throat> I'm going to come to that later today. <clears throat> I don't, yeah, maybe I've been. So, go ahead. Dan. I had a question about um, maintenance or ways to make maintenance potentially easier. So, I'm, I'm sort of wrestling with the, the, the proposal as you put it, and then the alternate proposal to do sort of optional. Mm -hmm. And for some of the categorical ones, um, my, my question is, 
I, I can't recall specifically as far as how you place parts in the hierarchy, meaning do you already have to, don't you already categorize them and or are there mappings um, that we currently have or maintain that would help you know, kind of organize so that, uh, you know, anytime you create a new one of these, it's sort of automatically added to the food allergy one or to the nut one. I recognize that won't work for the region ones, but for the areas that are more uh, collections, um, I, I don't know that the maintenance would be as difficult. That, so, yeah, so that's a good question. So you're saying that because the components, and I have to admit, I haven't looked at the, uh, the component uh, tree in or for allergies specifically uh, recently. Um, but yeah, you're right. Like, so those should be organized by, you know, food and then in theory, not underneath there and other things. So you, based on the hierarchy, you would be able to find all of the terms for that category, if it's foods or nuts or potentially core respiratory, even though that will. Right, this is, this is David. There's another, yeah, there's another thought too, like as, we're mapping parts to, you know, external things, external ontologies. We're mapping allergens to, um, you know, the FDA Unicodes. And I'm just wondering what kind of structure they have that may help in categorizing the parts for allergens, which, which may help. Um, so we may not have to do- And you could chime in on that, right? Yeah. You know, I, I, if I recall right, Uni didn't actually have a structure. That was kind of the problem, oh. but I'm okay. like, I might I be misremembering it. Yeah, I have a do, the, do the uni codes really map well to allergens? I mean, we also always usually have the uh, the immunocap code, and there's another one. I mean, the reason I bring it up because <laughs> the allergen codes break down by whether they're recombinant, uh, whether they're natural, just got, you know grinding up the stuff. And I don't know if the if the allergy if does does Unicode do that. I don't know. Um, I, I'm not saying it's not a bad yeah. idea to have a lot of linkage, but it might not be the most useful one for allergens. The yeah. beauty of these codes from some of the companies is you can get the website that tells you, you know, a five page monograph. Right. About, mm -hmm. about yeah. And we have all of the allergen codes listed as related codes and you can actually search by them as well. Mm -hmm. That actually would elevate them to the page. You know, if you click on them, but that's another story. Yep. <laughs> um, so I see another question uh, that came in. Um, and it's, uh, I'm not sure if this is relevant, but this is the manufacturer of the REST standards. All codes should be based on what they provide. And then there's a link to um, a Thermo Fisher website. And I think that's exactly the issue that we're trying to solve because each manufacturer has their own specific set of uh, components for each profile. And the problem is maintenance of that in LOINC. And the other piece of it is, does the provider know which manufacturer's profile the lab is using? Um, and Pam, maybe this is what you were getting to earlier, but you know, if I'm in my pediatrics office and I want to order a um, nut allergen profile on a patient, I don't think I would necessarily know is, you know, or, well, and the patient could potentially go to one of many different labs and each of those labs could potentially be using different manufacturers, um, you know, test kits. And so I think that's the issue is from the, you know, from the order side or from the provider side, you don't really know which one is being ordered. And then, you know, and then maintenance of all of that from the link side is really difficult. So, so was, I mean, would be good to get the input of some of the labs if we have them on the calls. Is Dr. Yao on the call? Um, sorry, I'm trying to get to that screen. I'm not sure. I mean, the the an issue that occurs to me is, you know, as as an ordering clinician, sort of the, you know, the the general name that you use that you want to do a, you know, a nut allergy or, um, you know, food allergy, et cetera. Uh, that's useful. But at the time of order, it, it seems like it's necessary that I, I could see exactly what I'm going to get. So it, I mean, it doesn't, I think we could even run into sort of payment problems if, 
you know, clinicians are ordering and they don't know what they're going to get, uh, whether they're going to get three results or five results or it's, and so I, I see the challenge with maintaining it in LOINC, but it seems like there's an obligation in the local system, uh, you know, wherever the definitive order is going to be done, you know, I need to know whether there's going to be hazelnut in there or not. If, if that's maybe for whatever reason, that's one that I'm, particularly concerned about. So I, I think I agree with what's being proposed, but we maybe need to be explicit about the responsibility of uh, the ordering system to be able to show exactly what's going to happen, you know, what, what is going to get ordered, uh, what, what things are going to be tested if I, if I order nut allergies in this system. Um, but it becomes a responsibility of, of the local system to know that based on what lab they're going to get this from, um, you hey, know, Steve, going forward. You know, EDOS would have helped that. Do you know what's the status of that? <clears throat> Where every lab was going to have a, could be a national sort of a catalog and you could get to it somehow with fire. You could maybe, you know, dialogue and get it settled. You know, if that's yeah. still alive. Yeah, order catalog is moving along, but um, no lab has adopted it really per se because we have to kind of work through fire, CLIO, and other aspects. It's more international where folks are starting to adopt it. Okay, good. There's not a reason for labs to do all the work right now to support it, and then you'd have to have EHR functionality to support, which most all US EHRs don't allow for dynamic updates currently with their with their catalogs. It's all manual per the ONC ACLA <clears throat> work so and meaningful tough, use. So that's another barrier. It's a tough problem then, huh? Well, even yeah. uh, any laboratory that has an outreach program where they have uh, some online ordering or even if they just do forms, there's education and a handshake that takes place between the clinician and the local lab on here's the education we can provide for you about the work we do. And this is the, these are the components within the things that we provide you so that there's a managed expectation for the clinician of the service that that local lab is going to give. No, I really, I really think that we're trying to make it uh, something to have like at a higher level in there, then this is, it's a business contract between the uh, laboratory and their clients. Well, so Medicare this, keeps this is, at those this, things at a high level, you know, and we don't know what's inside the difference, a lot of those either. I, I, how do they do that? How does CPT do it? <clears throat> There's one allergen code for CPT. Yeah. So, so power for individual ones. Now, this, this Rob, I, I want to support Stan's comment. I, I mean, I, you know, I think we're all re recognizing that there's a responsibility here that has to land on somebody's shoulders. That, with that, that it's just not going to work if someone doesn't shoulder some responsibility. I'm interested in the comment that was just made last because it seems to me that the response. Uh, you know, again, I'm agreeing with you, Stan. I think that. For this to work, the process that you're saying, it's either going to be in LOINC, which is where it is now, and then there's a lot of missteps, or it's going to have to be at the, the that interface between the lab and the ordering environment. And, um, or we just, no one will know, which seems clinically unsafe. And so, so if there's a way already in place where there's, and it seems like there must be, where the lab says, here's what we do then in essence, I think we're, we're somehow we have to communicate with the community to say that must include, you know, an establishment of the identification of the LOINCs. If you're going to use LOINCs as a part of the resulting process. Um, so, you know, and, and, and the only other thing I, I'm wondering, and I don't know if this is, I don't really feel like this is a great solution as if in creating these, so, you know, they wouldn't be naked panels. What they would be is that they would have everything as optional. And in essence, that would say, here's a template, but you've got to fill it out. 
in that process of communicating between the lab and the and the ordering environment. Well, well I would like to maybe accept, Salt may have a different opinion on this. I mean, I don't disagree with any of this stuff, but from a perspective of some immunologist friends of mine, that these tests are not like they're not like a COVID test in terms of their criticality. You know, in fact, some people argue this is sort of a a big money maker, but with little value. I, I'm going to get in trouble with that. But well, but but before you go too far down that that angle, Clam, it's going to be important in other. I mean, the approach that we take here with regards to identification, let's say antibodies, is going to you know it's going to be similar. I think. No, I mean we're all, we're not faced with the same explosion, nor do we not do it very detailed. <clears throat> So, but if, so, well, I um, guess, I mean, I think we should have a panel code and currently in, in FIRE, it's required to have an order code, I believe, for from LOINC. And it gives collective information and for both statistics and challenging what's going on in an institution. That when you're increasing, there's multi-institutional data. And I think either we give it, call them examples or we put them all together and say they're all optional so people have an idea. And then clearly there's going to have to be some communication link in between, but we can't do it. You know, if there was an EDOS, maybe we could, but we can't. It's not publicly available. <clears throat> so I'd really like to hear from uh, Maria. And sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but um, I think your insight's really valuable. So Maria is, I believe, from Thermo Fisher, and we promoted her to uh, panelists so she could help provide some insight, um, you know, about this whole issue. Ray, are you able to uh, unmute? Maria is a panelist and should be able to unmute. Maria? Well, can we unmute her, the powers? I have asked her to unmute herself and I see that she is unmuted, but I don't hear anything. Perhaps she's having audio concerns. Um, so in the meantime, there's another question that came in. Um, and it's, uh, is there a small group of allergens in all related panels that are central enough that they could be required and that group would distinguish the panel and everything else is optional or a way of saying everything else is optional? And I guess maybe I can just go back to this example of, you know, here's just three labs in uh, the US and these are their three non-allergy profiles. Um, and basically they overlap in terms of, let's see, one, two, three, three of the elements. And then, you know, and then um, looks like Quest has, I'm just estimating like eight or nine total, um, you know, Mayo has, uh, six total, or five total, and then LabCorp has three, four, five, six, seven. So, you know, out of anywhere from five to 10, there's only three that are the same. Um, so potentially we could do that. I think, I, I guess I'm not hearing a clear, you know, a, a sort of a leaning in one direction or another. So what I'm inclined to suggest is um, you know, that we, we don't go all the way to naked panels for the moment, but that we do try to include, and there's actually not that many, like the, for the categorical ones, it's really just these three food, nut, and core respiratory. So we could just, you know, like for nuts, there shouldn't be that many. The tricky thing is for food. I mean, there's, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of codes. And so I think picking out the most common food allergens and there's, you know, there are several lists for the top 10 or 15. Um, so we could put those in, but then have some explanatory text in the term description, um, you know, talking about the variations and making sure that the correct codes are being used. Um, and then, yeah, and then deciding what to do from there, I guess, seeing how that works out for a while. Well, well again, there's this concept so, in fire oh. of expandable. And maybe if you had a core, then they could always all be expandable. 
Right. And we have a business rule that says, you know, well, actually the business rule says that if you have a panel that, you know, essentially if you have additional um, optional elements, you can use this panel, but actually the rule doesn't work because I think it also says if the local panel has required elements that are not in the one panel, then that panel can't be used. Well, that's too strong. Yeah, the moment the moment you put one required element in a panel, um, it's amazing how much that can disqualify some some sites from being able to use it. I was just going to look up the core respiratory allergens to see if trees and grasses are in there. Um, I I could see that we leave all the child elements that are in there, but remove the required optional conditional mm -hmm. part of the framework and just leave it blank. Yeah. Um, I think that that has floated well for other labs that have implemented orders to be able to understand that if you see some child elements there that don't have a required element, if yours isn't in there, that's fine as long as it's along the same um, type of test. Well, I like that. But the, um, the core respiratory allergens is the uh, house dust, cat dander, dog dander, molds. So I would also like to see trees and grasses uh, follow the same suit on their order panels. Well, when you say core, is that like required? Well, the third one uh, in the box of the proposal, they, the name of the panel is core respiratory allergens panel. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, and it's a little bit strange. Like, I, I'm not quite sure why these three were created this way, and then we have all of the regional ones. But I'm also concerned that what's core respiratory in the US is not necessarily core respiratory in other parts of the world. Um, well, so. well, we don't just we we do have American house dust and European house dust. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> both, good. <laughs> both are required in the panel, <laughs> so there's an issue. Oh, brother! <laughs> so it, it looks like Maria has been trying to get audio. I don't know if she was able to. I Did see that maybe she called yes. that. Phone Can you hear me? Great! Oh yes! yes. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No, I don't work for Thermo Fisher, but here's where it comes in on my end. I'm in Ontario, and about I know of only one lab that doesn't provide it, but when you order something in the provincial testing laboratories, they do provide the FADI number or the immunocap number in the ordering requisition. So it's clearly shown what you uh, are getting or, and what you're ordering. Because, yes, very much there's a difference between milk, what kind of milk is it, cow's milk. Know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's very clearly stated on the order and requisition what the FADIA number is. And it turns out that at least here, almost everyone in the province sources the immunocaps. So order from one uh, system or, or from one testing facility or from another testing facility, they mm -hmm. both use that same FADIA number for that same naming convention. And you can then tie it back to Thermal Fisher's immunocap Rasta standard, which is beautiful that way because then, and especially liking that it in the link, uh, in the related names that it provides that, that standard uh, in there as well, you can tie it together to the link, clearly first off the bat. Um, so that definitely is a great tie in that way. Um, so yes, it does help in a swing straight off the bat what FADIA you're going to be, or sorry, immunocap allergen you're going to be using. Um, especially, and then hearing the discussion about the allergy panels, and that's where I see the issue as well. The panels can then end up being used because they have the, the, the name, the generic name. Oh, it's this Western, you know, grass panel, Western pollen panel. A lot of sites just don't understand you can't use that as a reporting panel um you don't then know how to tie it to the panel that then has those particular individual allergies as a robust uh, combination but those are um like i said those are the first ones when you're looking at the table um that have the mix and yeah it, it gets messy that way because then what are you testing what did it um i'm definitely leaning towards making sure that those fadia codes are in the 
and they should actually in some respects be in the print as well um, because I think those fa- uh, I'm not sure if there's any other manufacturers of standards but I think that the immunocap standards that have like the F you know 13 for this particular food allergen or G1 for this grass or P1 for that tree pollen um, I think those have been pretty much standardized um, Oh, it's nice to have that tie in together that when the physician does see it, this is hard, like hard coded. This is exactly what it is. Yeah. No questions and asked. Thank you. And we actually have those, we have those codes as related codes. Yep. We don't actually have them in the term name because there actually are a f- at least one other system and sometimes they collide. And so we've run into a few yep. cases where the same, you know, F, whatever number actually means two different things. And so, you know, cause we've talked about this a lot and how do we make this easier for people? And so that's why, you know, we wound Definitely. up putting them in the related names, but not actually in the term itself, because then that becomes more confusing if there is a collision between different systems. But Maria, yeah. I think what could be done is in the details page, we could have a link where you could actually get the monograph. I think that would yeah. be useful. And that, and that immunocap or the Thermo uh, Fisher website is very good for mm-hmm. having the details on it. It, it. I found it at least a decade ago. And right. they've since improved it. And it, is, and it does show, as you were mentioning, it does tell you whether this uh, sub-allergen for like a peanut is a recombinant versus a native um, it clearly shows those particular details in that website as well. Yeah. So Swatma, what do you want to do? <laughs> That's a good question. I think there's a few more uh, questions. Do we want to go through those? I think that would be the polite thing to do. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So the first question is, uh, could the history of how standardized parts of the CMP Comprehensive Metabolic Panel and BMP came to be help here. Um, and at least personally, I think those are a little bit different because those are, you know, very consistent across clinical care and across labs. I think, you know, basically there are seven components in the basic metabolic panel. The comprehensive ones can vary a little bit, but it's really the same. Um, I think it's a little bit different from the allergy panels, which it kind of like depends where you are in the world and which lab, but you know, there's a lot less variation, I think, in those. Um, and so I think that's, you know, that's a great thought, but I think this is just, it's a slightly different area. They're also federally mandated by, by billing. Right. Yeah. Right. I was gonna say, this was the one point that the committee could agree on back around 2006 when we started this. And that was, if CMS says this was in the panel, can we come to agreement? I just, uh, just, yes, just said one, um, thing though if um, you know we've been having some discussions with <clears throat> international you know like India has been looking at possibly submitting for India specific panels in you know even basic areas because they say that you know the, they or the way that they order tests is somewhat different um, so you know this kind of issue may end up spanning into other areas and domains Allergies. Yeah. We can face that when we get there. David, yeah. yeah, you're saying not just for allergies, but just in general? Right. I'm just saying, you know, just panels in general. Yeah. If a country declares a panel, it would be easy to adopt it. Right. right. Uh, so, so, uh, I think we had similar questions with the French uh, BioLink last year in Barcelona to, to adapt panels to France. And they were suggesting, as, as Andrea proposed, to use optionals. To use what, sorry? To use the, the O in the... Oh, yeah, right, right. Um, yeah, I don't know. Well, sorry, some, one, one consistent proposal is to take off the required optional for the current ones, put some additional text on the top, and then figure the rest of it out. <clears throat> yeah, because... Yeah, I just think it's challenging. So I, we could put O's on everything, 
but that doesn't really make sense because you know that not everything is optional, like in a nut allergy panel. Um, We've taken and, a much looser approach since these panels were created. Yes. And we do have panels that have some child elements listed that do not have the ROC column populated. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's true. So can we get agreement on that? Let's just take them off. Uh, how do we take a vote? We haven't made that process <laughs> yet. Know. Shall we That's have all panelists raise their hands if they, how about if they object, if there's objection? Okay, then we take not raising your hand disagreement. Yeah, for those panelists then, if you agree with the uh, proposal to just remove the population from the required optional conditional column within the uh, panel description and, and, Could and you, add text at the top saying that ordering people may have to clarify what exactly is going to be in their panel if they if it's important to them yes andrea the results and the loinks would still be listed just no population of the required optional conditional data element absolutely so if this is sitting well with you you make Can I smile. make oh. a friendly amendment? So, so Clem, in adding this text, do you, are you are we also saying that they could add things? Sure. Yeah, I think, they have I, to I think be we able should to add things. Yeah, we. Yes. I think we need to make that clear that that we we would say that. Yeah. So my my also amendment would be. We could call them extensive. I don't know that. Well, right. So in the business rules section, I think we need to be clear then about what it means for panels that don't have anything populated in ROC. I don't know that that's actually spelled out. <clears throat> um, I need to look, I guess, let me, um, I could actually pause my screen sharing and pull that up. Uh, hang on one second. Also, how are we doing for time? Because I, this is, Right, we are approaching one hour discussion on the okay. first agenda item. Yes, okay. we're, we're quite over time. I also want to point out the panelists are not able to raise their hands. Ah. Um, but if you like, we can put up a quick poll. It might take us just a couple of minutes to get that into the webinar. That might be um, the most efficient way to do this. I'm um, able to raise my hand. Yeah, I can raise you my are? hand too. Yeah. yeah, interesting. If you go to the participant pane. I can't, I, no, oh. I don't have that option. Huh. As I do see some raised hands. I don't know if that's testing or if that's <laughs> true. I think that's <laughs> testing. Okay. So um, strike Brother. that. We can raise our hands. Maybe it's a host. Um, you can oh. you can raise your you go in you go into the participant um, thing and it's down on the bottom. It says raise hand. Thank yeah, it is you. true that if you're a host, you can't raise your hand. Excellent. Thank you for host, sharing but, that. Right. Okay. All right. Okay. And I have actually just another short proposal just in the interest of time. So how about for now, we remove the required optional conditional values, add the clarifying text, um, and then, you know, keep including the result links. And then on the next lab committee call, which is next month, mm -hmm. um, so it's not going to be another six months before we come back to this, we can look at the business rules and, um, and you know, figure out what to do there. We could also do a voice vote. They did that all the time on HITECH. Just I, you know, those who disagree. But everybody doesn't have a microphone. Well, can everybody speak? Or go ahead, and I like your idea, Swap now. Let's do that. No, not everybody can speak. Uh, committee members are able to speak. Uh, okay. So they have been promoted let's, to let's, panelists. Let's go with Swap right. that proposal. Okay, so, so here's my- I like this, I like this approach. Okay, excellent. How about if you're a panelist and you disagree, and uh, actually attendees can also raise their hand. Sorry, I forgot. So if you if you disagree with this proposal, please raise your hand. Can you see the hands? I can't see any hands. <laughs> Swapna, it means that we also need, as Daniel proposed, we also need to describe what what is what the absence of ROC means. Right, exactly. And so I think that's why on the next lab committee call, I think we need to look at the business rules to see exactly 
what they spell out because I can't remember off the top of my head and then to actually put in information about exactly that. So yeah, but I think we have to move on. Right, exactly. So part of the proposal is looking, well, I guess that's not really part of the proposal, but you know, but basically I'm committing to looking at this on the next lab call, which is in November. All right. Um, okay. I okay. do not see any hands raised. I believe that this proposal passes. All right. Good. Excellent. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing. And uh, David, I will pass it to you for the next thing. Okay. Um, I will turn on my screen share in one second. Okay, so moving right along from um, naked panel to triple X system. Um, I, um, so this has been an issue for a while and, and it's sort of bec become a slightly different issue than it was before. So let me try to explain that. I mean, issues with triple X as a link system part first. Um, besides the, you know, sort of obvious you know, not wanting to get people in trouble. Um, the meaning has never really been clear, or at least people have used it to mean different things. Um, a test can be run on anything. A test that can be run on a specified set of samples that are not currently a defined link set, <clears throat> such as a recent one that came up, serum plasma synovial for Lyme testing uh, antibodies. David, could I interrupt? Yes. I think it's always meant on anything, and I don't know if it was, we can't spend time digging, but mm -hmm. that's what I remember from the first days. It was, you could put it on rock, water, scissors, whatever, mm -hmm. anything. So uh, this other issue is other is not as a different issue, and I don't know if we should get into it. Serum plasma, synovial fluid, that's what we issue about using body fluid. Right. It may be that, Clem, but the challenge is, is that the users have multiple different interpretations. No, no, I don't disagree so, with that. Right. It's, it's definitely is something that we need to resolve. Yeah, and, and I think these first three interpretations are things, are all ones that we've seen. And, mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, so the first, the second one has just come up recently, but that comes up all the time, uh, you know. And then the third one is, you know, sort of the use case for like public health labs where they can run their, you know, many of their, their assays on any kind of sample or many different kinds of samples, and they don't want the link to specify that, but they want to specify it elsewhere. Well, that's a whole other discussion. They can't. Right. But anyway, but what's the proposal? Well, I'm get yeah. Let me let me get there because this other this fourth issue that came up was sort of new to me, and so I just wanted to kind of bring it up. Um, and it's related to the fact that triple X in the um, Long common name tr translates to unspecified specimen. Uh, here's the example, and I don't want to spend too much time, and this is sort of a screenshot of a screenshot, so it may be hard to read. But this is from a lab director who reported this as an issue that it's sometimes impossible to choose the correct code. And what they're saying is that for copper test results that contain values from uh, multiple specimens, such as hair, liver, skin, or red cells for testing, the specimen is reported in another field, which is sort of like issue three that we saw before. But their problem was that choosing unspecified specimen as a long term is not intuitive because the lab has specified the specimen. Yeah, yeah, that's a problem. Yeah, so so they misinterpret unspecified to mean not unspecified by the long term, but actually unspecified by, by the lab itself. They don't know what it is. Um, so I think part A of this proposal would be to change the, the way this triple X system is translated to long common name. And instead of calling it unspecified specimen, just either say something like in specimen or, you know, or just null it out. Um, and here's kind of what it would look like <clears throat> if uh, copper mass per mass and unspecified specimen, this is mass content, would become copper mass content in specimen. So at least you'd remove that word unspecified. Um, <clears throat> you're removing both of them. 
Yeah. What was that, Clem? I'm sorry. Well, I don't think, I don't know that last, the second one, I, I know it takes, gets rid of the problem, but of course, it, I mean, it, it doesn't make good ret ret rhetorical sense. This one in, saying in specimen? Yeah, you know, it's like in lab or in specimen. Of course, it's in the specimen. You know, what, what are, how are people going to interpret that? But why do we have to have anything if we're being kind of op uh, vague? So, so basically take this bottom choice. Um, this is the other option. If it says triple X, just don't mention, just say it's copper mass content and then let, let it yeah. go from there. Um, so well, I think. Yeah, well, it's, it's all of them have problems, but let's hear from others. <laughs> Well, I, Andrea's got a comment in the chat box that I, I totally agree with, and that's um, regul regulatory governance over labs. They have to validate their tests on the specimens that they will be um, offering to do the testing on. Um, my, my question is more of just the maintenance feel of this. Uh, if uh, Don't we have algorithms in place to update the database for long common name and short name? Yes. And so <clears throat> those would have to be altered in order to, to remove everything altogether from those uh, terms that have the XXX system. Right. Well, part A of this proposal would be basically just changing the rules <clears throat> that generate the names. And we basically found there, there are 20 name building rules that we have to modify um, for this uh, for this purpose in order to change the way the name is the when name comes out in the short name and the long common name <clears throat> so this would be sort of the um, the implications of that first um, uh, that's first proposal um, so I sure appreciate you doing that work up to see what would be the workload burden and mm -hmm. John Snyder's got a, a question about the consumer names the impact there that's 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 a that's a whole other discussion. Yeah, I mean, I think that would have to be one of the things that we we look at. David, can you go back to the all the stuff that's impacted? So, you know, David and I were looking at this, um, and there's you know, like at face value, it seems like okay, well, maybe that wouldn't be such you know such such a big burden. But you know, essentially, there's many systems. There's lots of name building rules. Um, and the, I think the, the count of 20 includes the display and the consumer names as well. Um, you know, there's term descriptions that would have to be updated. This will definitely affect the groups because the group names include the system in the actual name itself. Um, you know, we have overrides that would have to be updated. There's a whole thing with the multi-axial parts where there's more than 2,000 multi-axial parts that include XXX. Um, and so those would all get updated as well. And I think, at least personally, just as we were, you know, sort of doing this exercise of seeing everything that would be impacted, at least I started leaning more towards just updating the names, which would be a much smaller job than actually updating the system, which was, you know, the part B of the proposal was to actually right. update the system itself. And sorry, I realize I got a little bit ahead of things. Um, so anyway, so yeah, so definitely like the name, we would have to look very carefully at the names and, you know, if, I guess regardless of which change we do, whether it's just updating the names or updating the system itself, we would start with just a very small set and proceed, you know, very sort of carefully and checking all the our error logs and, you know, looking at how the changes affected everything else downstream. Um, I think that would be a big part of the work. This is not a small, update this, this rob can can you just confirm so xx we you know you kind of gone through xxx but is the semantics the same for all the other xxx plus something else yep so yeah, it just yeah. means so any body fluid or Correct. any stent i mean i i guess yep. i'm just not quite <laughs> understanding that seems like a weird thing but that is yeah <laughs> okay so <clears throat> So yeah, maybe we need to go because um, that idea of having a, um, you know, kind of <clears throat> bracketed, you know, fill in the fill in what you know here kind of thing might make things clearer. Most well, laboratories the along the way, when they have, if they offer an assay on multiple systems, 
but they don't need to change the reference ranges or, or anything about the reporting element, they will have an additional supportive field that says this is the specimen source, um, which I think someone has right. alluded to earlier on. So it, it comes mm -hmm. in tandem. Someone's talking about, well, it'll be a problem if we you know, leave it blank and it has to go into a repository. There are often um, two answers that come back for the one test and the not that anybody's using the SPM segment for specimen, but they're using another OBX field for the specimen. Did, did you see the yeah. comment about uh, taking away XXX in the, in the comment from Saheed? Yeah, I'd have concerns about removing XXX altogether. I mean, I, I would prefer to keep it as is and provide education on the mapping aspects. Um, but the alternative is if you take away the XXX, um, then something like a wound culture that can be done on hundreds of body sites would require labs to create hundreds of new loinks and yeah. lab tests for each single body site, which is combinatorial explosion and a ton of work. And I can guarantee physicians will hate trying to scroll through 200 wound cultures for each type of body site, you know, um, if you go that direction, kind of the other ditch. So this is kind of aligned with how labs try to balance both. <clears throat> so Andrew, yeah, I think we're not really proposing to eliminate XXX, uh, you know, the terms that have XXX, but we're talking about possibly changing XXX to specimen and changing the way it translates to the long, to the long common name and display name. So really we're just talking yeah. Everything causes problems, it seems like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a couple of comments. And sorry, if you're a panelist, actually, I guess we should have done a little bit of more housekeeping at the beginning. So if you're a panelist, um, if you could actually speak, because when you put in a chat comment, the whole audience can't see it. So I'm going to read them out loud uh, for now, but I think, in, or you can put something, well, actually, I don't think you can put anything in the Q&A. But um, anyway, so yeah, you can just unmute and, you know, and, um, and say your comment. But um, let's see, so there's using null or leaving it blank for specimen can be an issue with some repositories that expect a value in that field. Um, and so, yeah, I completely agree with that. And we we wouldn't have it be null or leave it blank. Um, there will also be impact to external systems that have implemented consistent logic around XXX. OBR 15 is defined as the specimen source. And then also XXX and link support specimen type and or source. Um, Andrew, I'm not sure what, okay. yeah. what, what do you mean by that? I'm not sure I understand your last comment, XXX support specimen. Oh, like you can include either, it can be used for either one, sorry. Yeah, uh, this is Stan. Uh, so I was the one who made XXX. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, and I mean, it's been described appropriately that it, it 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 meant two things, uh, and and one thing prob well, and and I think we need to think about ordering versus resulting. Uh, you know, as as Andrea said, there are situations where you want a single order code uh, for for this test, uh, and then, but the other thing that's been asserted, which I think is true, is that it's you know. Uh, when you when you do the test when it's resulted you need to you need to say what the specimen was um, and so again the xxx had two meanings one one meaning was that somewhere else in the message uh you know either in the obx or actually as a as a, a subordinate obx you could say what the specimen was so it was done as a post a post coordinated representation or the other meaning was that it just isn't specified and in in the order it may you know it, it may be legal if you will to to not have uh the specimen specified in in the in the in the loint code that's being ordered but somewhere in the order i think there's an obligation to say what the specimen is so uh, but i think uh I also was the one who proposed the curly braces <laughs> representation so that it didn't mean anything. It meant 
you know, you could say uh, in specimen, or you could say if, if you knew that this was a body fluid or, you know, uh, and it's, it's general across other things like setting so that you know what's, you know something about the value set of what can fill in, you know, for, for specimen or for setting or for, you know, something else. Uh, so, you know, I like, I like this and I, I, and I think the only objection is it's a lot of work. And so I think we could, you know, don't, don't say we're going to do this all at once, but, but do this uh, in a, in a stepwise way where we have time, time to do it, but essentially replace all X axis. The other thing that's come up and you guys, you know, you, you get into trouble. Uh, you put a loint code in a code and then it gets interpreted as a pornographic uh, reference. <laughs> so I've, I mean, I've seen that actually quite a few times where my, an email, <laughs> That, that contains a, an XXX loint code gets rejected because of a, uh, a spam filter. Maybe we should add an X to it, make it quadruple X, then it'll be yeah. the idea. <laughs> they draw a lot more attention. So, you know, I, I, I like this. I like the proposal to go ahead and use the curly brace strategy. And it, it does mean that, you know, people are going to have to change their logic to instead of looking for XXX, look for curly brace specimen uh, in how they process these things. But I, I think that's the right way to go. But, you know, the challenge is we don't know how clinicians will think of these words and what, well, it'll look, it'll, will it look like gibberish to them and they'll go, what the heck is this? I mean, that's the challenge. What do people you think? It, you think they, it's worse than XXX? <laughs> well, they've been doing that for 20 years and we haven't got too much complaints. I'm always saying it's it changes not always good from from something that's been working. I, I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. I just don't know, you know, what the immediate question is how do we get rid of the word unspecified and the implication it seems to have and what other words would we use? And the other thing well, is the other word you could use there is is specified elsewhere. Mm, yeah, yeah, I was yeah, that was another possibility, right? Well maybe we should just spell that out. Specimen specified elsewhere. And it gets along. But the other one is that we've always had the problem of being able to distinguish between a biologic specimen and anything else, where XXX was sort of played both roles uh, in, dif in different people's minds. Okay, I think if we, if we can come to an agreement on part A, um, at least in the sense that we say we think we do need to change the specimen, the, the translation of the triple X specimen type to something other than unspecified specimen to avoid that sort of misunderstanding that laboratory people seem to have. Then we can, okay. you know, then at least maybe next at the next meeting, we can commit to coming up with a proposal for this name, what this name should be. Yeah, um, I, I like that now, David. Mm -hmm. David, this is John. Just a, a question out of ignorance. Is there any concern that if we use the word specimen that there would be confusion between that and isolate? And that's a question for the laboratorians on the call. Mm -hmm. I, I personally would not confuse specimen with isolate. Okay. Others? Well, I mean, you could, you could, if there, I'm trying to think if this is true or not true. I mean, if, if there's an important distinction, you could do curly brace isolate instead of curly brace specimen in a situation where, an, where, where the test is specifically on isolate, but the isolate, the exact kind of isolate would be specified again somewhere else in the message. Well, well that's, I think, a different question. Because a lot of times no one knows where it came from. That someone just sends them the isolate. Yeah. Especially that. Okay. Yeah, an isolate is a derived specimen. So it's not collected on its own, but um, is a part of the culture process. Just like um, a urine sediment is also a derived specimen. There's a few of those. 
So, so could we just maybe agree on the things we'll get rid of this unspecified and make it in specimen? Maybe we ought to talk to the people that are complaining about you know, the guys with the copper to see if that will work for them. Yeah, you know, that's a good idea. And I also, right. um, you know, I also think that we could potentially say something like specimen specified elsewhere or something, even though that's much longer. There is one more question in uh, the chat. So maybe we can just um, look at or answer that really quick and then, you know, decide on the name change and then leave the other actual updating the system part for later. But um, the question is, or it's, not, it's more of a comment, but the curly braces are confusing from a computer science perspective. Why not use uh, hats or uh, three carats instead of XXX? Um, right. That's, I mean, clearly our car carats are, are, have a specific meaning in LOINC as part of the LOINC name. Exactly. Yeah. The, yeah. That and means, they interfere with so. HL7 messages as well. So that it, it's sort of two issues, you know, the carats mm -hmm. that we already use in LOINC are actually known to interfere sometimes with HL7 messages. But that's a whole different. And and we're already using curly braces. The curly braces strategy right. elsewhere in Loink. So that's not that's not, it's not new to use the curly braces in Loink. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So it, so should we vote on this or do we raise hands to those who don't like this idea? Sure. So how about so. The idea is that we will remove unspecified, but then discuss what to actually put in, whether it's specimen or something longer um, well, in I the think, next. I think, we, I think we should say, pick a, pick a thing, get it done. Say, go to specimen. Let's just go to in specimen then. How's that? If people don't like it, they won't raise their hand, but then we get it done. Okay. okay. So I vote for something shorter, like in specimen, rather than in specimen specified elsewhere. That's just... and, and so just to clarify, we're only talking about updating names. We're not talking about changing the attribute. Correct. Right. So if you disagree with that, please raise your hand. I can't see if anyone's raising okay. their hand. We have one person so far that has disagreed. One, oh, one attending. Oh, sorry. One panelist. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. My screens are being funny. Disagreed with saying in specimen. Is that right? So. Right. That's the only thing we're voting on right now is whether we yeah. should change the names from in unspecified specimen to in specimen. So, so far only the three. I guess the three, well, I guess I don't really know how to do this. I mean, I, I guess I'm not clear on if you're, if you want to leave it as an unspecified specimen or if you prefer to say in specimen specified elsewhere. Or no. Or, you this know, is Sean. Just, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Sean. Okay, so I voted no because this is just an example of something I'm not convinced that the view is worth the climb because I think you'll get another type of ambiguity in terms of saying in specimen. Uh, so then there'll be a, you know, in the next round, we'll be discussing why, how people don't understand what in specimen means versus XXX. Yeah. So, so you know, it's been XXX for quite some time. I don't have a clear sense for um, how big an issue that is. Oh, I can see at least for the folks that we work with, it's not a big issue. I mean, it, it comes down to understanding what it means. Um, outside the spam filter issue that <laughs> Stan raised, but yeah. you know, it, it's, it's, uh, I, I, it just, uh, it seems like, you know, having clear editorial policy around what it means is more important than changing it. Yeah. Uh, and Tom, sorry. So just to clarify, so this was not to actually change the system value. Oh, no, I understand that. Um, yeah. but, okay. but and, and that was clear, right? Um, but, you know, and, and it was my comment that, you know, and, and I mean, you know, we make the change if the change occurs, but we use the descriptions, um, you know, and the semantics that are sort of implied by the description uh, to do downstream things as well, right? So not the fact that the code would go away, but the fact that the description would change would have impact. Well, I agree. I mean, I'm not, I agree that in general, Stability is better than uh, perfection. Yeah, and, and I, and this is Rob, I, I hear those things loud and clear, and I think they're very much in play here. But for me, the reason I, I agree with this change is that uh, the idea of unspecified specimen 
has a very specific meaning that actually is not the main thing this is describing, <laughs> which is there is a specimen that's specified. And, um, and so... Well, not always. <laughs> that's the other problem. But yeah. I'd, like just get, I'd go for the change to specimen just to get it done. Okay. And I think, so Clem, we only have 13 minutes before you have to go, I believe. No, no. You have to drop off at 1030. Is that right? Uh, or, or 10. Let's see. What time is it? I, you know, I don't... <laughs> anyway, and the other two, so one person didn't want the names to change, and then the other raised hand was uh, voting to make it no, so just I think meaning taking well, off take away the specimen. Mm. The problem with null is we don't put the name the specimens in for things because we assume one in some cases. You know, the, in yeah. the common name. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well so I think this pa I mean I, I it sounds like this passed. Yeah, I agree. So okay, so part A passed. I don't know if we should I mean I think part B we're we're still struggling with because of the the effects that we we will have you know on having to alter lots of things within loink and possibly affecting downstream systems i do think we sh we probably should consider doing it and do we want to take this vote now or do we want to take this vote next month a swap it's not till 10 30 when i have oh to good on. okay So I don't know. Do I think I would like to, and I guess I don't know how this, how I can know this, but I would like to know, you know, have some scope of how many downstream systems would have to update whatever is hard coded in their rules or, you know, um, wherever it is. And I, I don't know if that's a knowable thing. Yeah, um, I think it's going to be hard to find that information. <laughs> Out. But I guess, I mean, I mean, we have, you know, more than 100 people on this call. I wonder if, if you are somebody who is using Loink downstream and has something in place where you have some rules that are hard coded related to XXX and this would affect you, I guess if you could, you know, send an email through our, you know, contact us. Um, well, no, just, it's, it's John. I can confirm I had logic at Diameter Health yeah. to deal with XXX. So that's one vendor. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. and I guess the level of impact, I mean, um, cause there will be some work on our end, you know, but right. it, we can eventually, you know, it's once we've got everything updated, then we're good. But is that the same, you know, for others? I mean, how much? Well, I can imagine that a lot of users out there take XXX system to be the sort of a class code over the other loink terms that have a specified specimen. Um, well, I can, I mean, I, I mean, I, I had something like like that too. Um, well, where I had my previous thing. So, um, so I think Shahid's point is really well taken. That we we kind of diddle with this stuff when we've asked people to use it, and I think that's a risky position. Okay, so I think this, it sounds like this is on hold. Like we need to collect more information. Well, well I'm st I still voted for making it just go to sp in specimen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because get closure. Okay, so part A I think is a yes, part B is on hold. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's a great suggestion um, doing the community survey before making the change. Um, so I think for this, for part B, um, actually, and we have that user survey coming up, so maybe this could be uh, part of that. So if somebody has a stake in this, then they can respond to the survey as well. Okay. Okay, great. I think that's that's done. So. All right. Thanks. Um, okay. So maybe should I just do my thing next, and then Clem, do you want to go, or do you want to go ahead and talk about the semi plan? Uh, go ahead. Do your thing. Okay. <laughs> All right. So the next topic. Uh, switching gears a little bit is, oops, whoa, sorry. Okay, do you guys see the document? It's proposal to remove IVD vendor information from long term descriptions? Yes. yes. Okay, awesome. Um, so that's exactly what this uh, proposal is about. So just as some background, uh, several years ago, I wanna say at least 
you know, six years ago, we started including information in the term description uh, about the specific vendor or, you know, and test kit that the term was created for. And, you know, something like this term was created for, but is not limited in use to, and the vendor's name and test kit name, test kit. And our main purpose for doing this was to help users figure out which terms to use not because we were making you know vendor specific terms or we wanted to advertise for specific vendors and at the time you know when we started doing this most vendors were not actually publishing their link mapping so we were just trying to do a service uh for the community and i have some screenshots i realize they're a little bit small but you can you know maybe you can see or you could go to this link code and it talks about the um you know the manufacturer and the test kit name in the term description um and then here's another one, um, you know, same thing. This term was created for, but it's not limited and used to blah, blah. And then here's another example of a multiplex where we actually attempted to like include all of the different links for two different manufacturers and update those over time. And so you can see the term description has turned into, you know, a little bit of a mess with, with you know, different test kits and including as much information as we could about what's in those specific kits. Um, but as you can imagine, that's difficult to maintain over time. And then a few years after we started putting this information in the term descriptions uh, in 2017, the IBD Industry Connectivity Consortium or IICC uh, basically developed the specification for how to publish LOINC mappings for IBD products. And it's called uh, LIBD or LIVID. Um, and I have some links in the document, you can get more information about it. And we know of many vendors that are currently publishing their link mappings in this format. And we're actually using the same format kind of in a different way to publish uh, the SARS-CoV-2 mappings, um, you know, with all the link order and result codes that's published by the CDC. And so in a way, you know, the pandemic might actually help promote um, some increase in the livid file use as well. And so the issues related to this, um, so including the vendor specific information gives the impression that we're creating vendor specific terms and panels. And we've heard from labs and other vendors that they're reluctant to use the codes because they, you know, because it seems like they're specifying the other vendor uh, or, you know, a different test kit than whatever the lab is using. Um, one of the other issues is that, you know, we can't provide that much information this way. And basically the second we publish it, it becomes obsolete because then something changes, uh, you know, or maybe that's not true all the time, but you know, something changes and then maybe that code is no longer actually appropriate for that test kit or the test kit has been updated and the panel hasn't been updated, but you know, it's, it's in the way it's similar to the allergy panels where it's just hard to maintain. And so my proposal is actually to remove the vendor information from the term descriptions and to encourage vendors to use the livid format to publish their link mappings. And, you know, just as an aside, not directly related to the proposal, but I have been um, speaking with members of IICC on, you know, potentially figuring out like a central source for, um, you know, someplace they could host the livid mappings or have, you know, a lookup tool or something like that. But that's, you know, that's in the future, not directly related. Um, but for the moment, I'm just proposing removing the vendor information from the descriptions. So, so, so let me speak to, to mm -hmm. some of those and against some of it. So the reason this really came up early when certain tests came out, they're the only test there was. Um, there's for some of the, um, some bacteria or virus or whatever it was, something that had the word gold in it, people couldn't find a thing without knowing the brand name. And so that would be, I think for that purpose, it was very helpful. So I'd be okay with taking it out of the description, but I think, I guess, think in terms of information loss. We know this at the time we're putting the term in, and I would like to see it somewhere indexable in, in another field so people can still find it that way. I mean, that we don't throw away information. Yeah, but, and we, you know, we wouldn't, like we're not going to delete it. We have it saved in inside link, like inside our internal, you know, tables no, and stuff. External. No, I know, I know. And I think, you know, in the future, I think we could I think mean, of the a way. Stuff, the living stuff is going to take a long time to get together. They don't let anybody look at it right now. It's all company by company. 
and uh, there's nothing illegal. And if we just take away the emphasis by putting it in a field that could be searchable, we there's no more work because we know when we put the things in who they came from. But then people, we can put it in the index lookup and people could find stuff that way. Do you think that would cause the same upheaval with the vendors? In a way, I think it would. Like if we only had one vendor listed. Yeah, but it's the first one. And what right. else can we do? No. <laughs> no, I know. I know. It's tricky. It's when they get their stuff in. Right. But then, you know, but then it falls back on us. Like, so then let's say all the vendors start sending us all their information. Then it's, you know, we just, we don't have the resources to be able to keep up with that right now either. Well, we don't. Well, it kind of goes both, you know, like, so there's, there's a couple of issues. Like we just don't have the resources. If people were to send that information to us, which would be great, I'm, but we just. But we, you're you're turn, turning, in, you're, you're, I'm not suggesting you take all vendors. I'm suggesting that we have the information in our files. Why don't we put another field that's not as highlighted that people can search on that brand name and see well, and they can find in the general search. We can with with solar, you know, you don't have to even display it, but you could still search on it. I'd, I'd like to know what other people think. I just don't like throwing away information. We do and have an I IVD rep on the on the call. Connie Felder has her hand raised. I have promoted her so she can unmute and uh, speak. Yes. Oh. Hello. Can you speak? Can you hear me now? Maybe? Yes. yes. Good. Okay. So yeah, we just, I mean, um, through our mapping now for these lift uh, activities, um, we just saw, saw several, several times, um, you know, other vendors um, name in the description. And I think this is not a use case uh, in the future anymore that you look up for something which is vendor specific, right? You want to have the, the code and the component and the name and the specimen. And it's anyway just descriptive text. But I don't see why we should, should have that anymore. I mean, uh, I, I don't see it's possible to search except in Excel sheets. Maybe, you know, there you have the possibility to search kind of information, but it's in the description. And, and I think it should be removed because Loink is not doing something for each and every vendor. Otherwise, you know, if, if yeah, I would say, oh, no, no, and I need another Loink code. And we have these discussions also, you know, that we will have countries, they want to have a Loink code for each and every test developed by each and every other manufacturer. And I think this is, this is another use case, but that maybe not the one we would like to support in a uh, yeah in a world um, with a lot of fair principles in, if it comes to data. Well, to clarify, I'm for taking it out of the description. Um, Xavier, Xavier, talking for Barry Mario, I just concur to what Cody just said. I don't think this information is, has a good reason to stay within the link description. Um, the risk you're taking is to see vendors, marketing teams looking at your door and saying, well, I want my names to be bright and in bold characters. I mean, I don't think though that this information has its place in, in Loink. Although I know we have many of our product with our names inside, so I don't think this is completely, it's completely fair to remove it. This also opens the discussions that you mentioned something at the beginning is where to also a central livid things, living David repository. This is another discussion, but at some point it will we will need to take it too. But this this is not in the loading description to my point of view. I concur yeah. to what Connie said. Thank you. Yeah, and this is Andrea. Um, I would was wondering a lot of the vendor or initial requesters that's in the details tab. Um, is it possible it could be listed there? Um, that way, if someone who's mapping wants to see why this link was originally created, or um, but recognizing that other vendors may also use the link, so it's not specific to a single vendor, it's just the first one that submitted the request. For example, BMRU funded creation of many amino assay links, and but those are also used for like Roche and Abbott assays. So as a mapper, it's like, oh yeah, this would be a link code that I could use 
if I have any of these vendors, um, those other vendors may not be listed and it'll allow kind of the in-between until a lot of the um, livid links are more pervasively available. So Andrea, we actually don't list the requesters or the source anymore. Um, we did and then several years, oh, sorry, I was just gonna say several years ago, we removed them, I think, because there were some requesters that didn't want to be listed. And so we actually do not display that information at, at this time of who requested a particular code. Hey, I'd thank also, you. I'd also like to point out over time, since we got 25 years under our belt, that there are product lines that come and go. Uh, GenProbe is one example. Um, we had links created specifically for their uh, infectious disease testing. And then in 2012, they merged with Hologic. So at some point, someone's going to have a Hologic package insert, not a GenProbe package insert. And they, if they were looking and, and hinging on that, they're not going to find what they're looking for. Well, I thought we had a product name, not the, not the company name, but it may come out the same. Well, again, to be clear, I'm, 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 I'm not, no, no one's arguing against taking it out of the description. The question is, should it be anywhere searchable in the like table? table? I mean, Pam makes a good point about the change too, and we probably have actually descriptions that still need to be updated. And I know we have had to update others in the past just by us randomly finding out about the merger or whatever right. um, and knowing to go in and do it we're going to have the same problem with the searchable field, um, having to maintain that, having manufacturers then, you know, contact us and want their name in there as well, searchable. Um, one thought I had was possibly uh, like our community mappings that we have, maybe, maybe it would make sense right away for vendors, um, manufacturers to provide us their mappings and we can somehow load them in and, um, and, and they could routinely, they could be the ones who update and maintain those mappings and then provide them to us. And then we can somehow represent them in LOINC. That's really interesting, Jamie. And that actually, like, why couldn't we just use the community mappings? You know, but instead of a particular hospital or lab, you would have the vendor name and- Yeah, yeah so this Rob, I, I actually think that the idea of, of in, encouraging uh, you know, kind of sharing of mappings is, is generally something that's really a valuable thing to think about. And that may be, you know, a general solution that gets us out of this problem. The other thing is I just want to encourage us to push towards thinking about these things as a federated set of information. The idea of Livid being the source of truth for this and promoting that, just keeping what we need to in order to have the, I mean, obviously there's gonna be an alignment with initial requests from a particular vendor, but, um, but I think that the descriptions and all that sort of stuff should be federated information and just encouraging, you know, kind of say, go to Livid. Yeah, and they could give us their Livid files, you know, and we could use that information to, you know, populate so in LOINC, so. I mean, I don't wanna make that too, um, let's say, <laughs> uh, negative. But you know, we're update, I mean, we're getting new tests out there every two, three, let's say, let, every month, there will be new tests. And just to the effort now we saw with COVID-19 to get in contact with certain um, people to get it published is kind of huge. So we're starting with this lift format and the customer will ask for it and I hope they are asking the vendors, which because the use case is usually, I'm going to buy a new Biomere instrument and I have these five tests for it. So please tell me the links or the same with the with Roche assay, uh, instruments. So there will be more use cases. I, I fully understand, but maintaining that on a central database with a kind of a request um, mechanism is I think uh, a huge effort you don't want to maintain. So but then, it, but it has to happen someplace. Would have to have access, right? So for right. me, as a as someone who maps the table, I will do the you know the products we have in Roche and map them to a Loink test, a Loink test, which hopefully 
it's not specified to any vendor because otherwise, you know, <laughs> what's the purpose of, of a, an agreement here on, 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 on Loinx on making it easier to say, okay, this is our equivalent, let's do the test we are using. So, and then really maintaining that on a, on a, on a global um, server or on Reagan Street, I think for now it's a wishful thinking. So maybe in three years, let's come back, right? But right now it would mean that I would kind of need access to the Loink database or Reagan Street database to update the changes more frequently. I agree with Connie that we would be behind. We wouldn't be current and it. There would be probably a concern that users would be looking at what we have rather than going to the vendor and doing the mappings. Well, could I just clarify the limit thing we started that that wasn't an independent critter. It was in, and we, we got uh, the, and Michael Waters then took the banner and ran with it. And it's a great thing, but it is unlikely that in our next five years, there will be any agreement of all the vendors to put it in a central system. They're very resistant. So uh, but anyway, let me drop my objection and let's just go ahead and get, get, the, get the deal done. Okay, and I think it's just in the interest of time, let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and take a vote. So if you disagree with removing the vendor information from the term descriptions, um, please raise your hand. What you may imagine to do uh, is instead of hosting all the livid centrally at Reconstruct is hosting a URL to where those livids are stored. Mm -hmm. Which already be a start to a centralized thing. So you get my agreement on this proposal, nevertheless. Okay. And I can't see um I can't see the screen where uh, hands are displayed right now, so. I'm not seeing any raised hands, Swapna, um, and a couple of agreements in the chat box. So it looks like it's unanimous unless anybody has any last minute hands to raise. All right, awesome, thank you. Swapna, I have a question. Uh, Joseph Yao, Mayo Clinic. I think the hand raising symbol went away yeah. On my screen. So nowhere for us to raise or lower. Oh, it's in the participant uh, kind of sub menu. If you click on participants. Well, uh, well, in the future, I think we should just let the voice up and let everybody say yay or nay. That's worked pretty well on a big committee I've been on. Thank you. Thank you. Did, Dr. Yao, did you find the raise hand? Yes, I did. Thank you. Oh, great. Okay. Okay, um, Clem, do you want to go ahead then with the semi-con discussion? Well, I've got two things and one will be, well, I think one should be easy. So first I'm going to make an assertion and I like people, lab experts, just tell me if I'm wrong. My understanding is the Ehrlich unit means one milligram per deciliter. It's by definition. And so first, uh, you know, Joseph or any of you, is that wrong? If it's right, why are we using the Ehrlich unit? And shouldn't we kind of at least evolve away from it? <laughs> Good question. I think uh, there are some assays, mainly serologic assays or immunoassays. Um, they use their, their units in their performance of these ELISA-based assays use uh, Paul Ehrlich units, PEU. And, you know, these assays are not meant to report out the quantitative results. But I guess some research labs or clinician wanted to know the degree of positivity. So it kind of forces the labs to report out these. Um, but I agree with you that uh, if it's not, it's not the intention of the assay manufacturer to report out these. It's mainly used for QC monitoring and um, <clears throat> assay cutoff. It's not meant for patient care purposes. So I agree with you that um, it's it's not a good way to uh, to report and use these units. Well, where it really gets confusing is now you'll see the the timed uh, specimens will say 
Ehrlich units per milliliter. So that really is one 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 milligram per deciliter per 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 I mean per per 24 hours. That doesn't even make sense. You know, it doesn't compute. So what I guess would like maybe permission that we would um, either find a way to to um, represent the kind of the passe stuff so that it's, it's still present. People can see it somehow, but recommend that the normal units are, are milligrams per deciliter. So uh, it, I don't know whether we, should we do, a, try to do a vote on that or is that necessary? Or any other lab people on the call that could, you know, tell, t say this is a stupid idea or a bad idea? You know, what we ought to end up with turning on the voice for everybody for some of these discussions. Uh, Clem, we will not be able to turn on the voice for all 100 attendees, but all of the panelists are able to voice their opinions. Well, it's not physically possible? Okay. No. Okay. no. And if there are attendees that uh, are committee members, um, please let us know. Raise your hand and I'll message you and make sure that you are moved what over about, as a panelist. What about if somebody really wants to say something? Couldn't we give them the speech privileges? Uh, individually, yes. Well, uh, if and so they, can, might, they can put yeah. something in the question and answer. It is a good box point. And we can identify there. Xavier and Joseph and Anna uh, all have their hand raised, and we're not certain since you know the vote just ended. Do your hands need to go down that the vote is over, or well, I think they you have something talk, to say. Uh, can we let them talk? Well, Joseph and Great Xavier are already. So, sorry, Pam, I just found a way out to raise my hand. So I just raised the hand to say, yes, I do. I do agree. Okay, Xavier, we're going to lower your hand. And now I remove my hand. Okay, thanks. We got you. Yeah, I, uh, I removed my hands too. Sorry, I was voting. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> don't, don't remove your hands, keep them. Uh, but all right, well, the second subject is, uh, is a complicated one, and we may not get resolution and maybe people get good feedback, uh, especially laboratory people over, over time. So it's a semi-quantitative. I, I think I've, I finally, under, you know, semi-quantitative is a defined thing in the FDA uh, so that when the package inserts will say semi-quantitative explicitly. And it's a really tough issue to try to, um, to get a clear definition, an operational definition of semi-quantitative out of some of the regulatory organizations. And it says something like things that can't be uh, drawn on a on a you know on a, a linear scale, but what I think it really can be uh, practically or operationally translated to is something that's going to be reported in segments and ranges because the scale isn't quantitative for the whole scale. Uh, and if that's the case, I think we should if we should create it because there's lots of things that are just like, you know, one to five, five to 10, 10 to 20, like in your, your analyses, those are, those are semi-quantitative and that would distinguish them from just presence and some of our other complexities. And, there's, there's, there, and then those laboratory instruments that are specified explicitly as semi-quantitative, that w we would label them as semi-quant. So I, I think this may be a longer discussion, but it might need some real, uh, text dialogue, but I, I just wonder what people who can talk now think. Can no one talk? Is that what it is? Or There are 25 people that can talk. Yes. Okay. And um, everybody can put in a question. Yes. Okay. Does so it, uh, our audience really does need to use the question and answer piece. And then the 25 panelists should be able to speak. Okay. Dr. Yao, do you have thoughts on that? Or is that, I think it would clear, it would, it would make some things easier for us to manage. And I don't think there's millions of things that would have to change. Yeah, no, I agree, Clem. Uh, what is the uh, question you're asking well, I think that decide. we don't have a scale called semi-quant. We have quantitative, ordinal, nominal, 
um, and, and, and we, we put most of the semiquans end up, well, either we make up two terms in some cases, and then in some cases they become ordinals. Yeah, so um, how does the semi-quant result come, how is that displayed or expressed, reported? Uh, well, I'm, I, we don't officially do anything with it. Uh, and it's tricky because <laughs> The FDA doesn't give crisp um, operational definitions. Uh, so I know one company that had a semiquan for a toxicology test. That's how it was reported. And what they said they actually do, um, they will report it as um, ordinal uh, sometimes, but they'll send a number to the ER uh sometimes and there's and they use they also send a number to the people do who do the mass spec so they can you know, set their system up uh, and then some people just use it as a number that's a different <laughs> slightly different case but there's lots of things and i we can dig them back out where you really have some kind of buckets that you're describing and i think if there's a series of buckets with numbers on each end and there's some many different examples that are not all simple ranges. Uh, those I think would fit semi-quam because it's not a linear scale. It, it, it's a sum, it's a, it changes, you know, by the, by the buckets. Yeah, uh, Clem, this is Andrea. I, I think your ask, is it about things like urine dipsticks where depending on how the lab has it set up, it might be a numeric result. Um, it could be a range, some specific gravities on some vendors are like, you know, ranges of 0 0.005 for specific gravity. There's a, or it, it may be a qualitative or semi-quant like the one plus, two plus, three plus. Um, it'd be helpful to know which ones you're kind of looking for. It's semi-quant that I'm talking about. The things that are yes, no are, are pretty simple. I mean, those are qualitative and, um, and, and it, we call them present thresholds because actually underneath they usually have some cutoff they decide is present for the, all those things that are detected. But these things that you get, you get a series of answers with numbers in them. Um, it, it, some of the ordinals are that way, but the, the real ordinals don't give you any numbers, but it's where you have, you know, one to five, five to 20, 20 to 50. That I would call semi quan but it'd be nice to get official get engagement with sort of some regulatory aspect of it to get it settled. So maybe some of the lab vendor, I, th I think it's a longer discussion and the lab laboratory vendors, but I, uh, does anyone hate the idea of ever coming to a semi quantum scale if we can define it well? I'm, I'm then wondering are if, you go ahead, Xavier. Are, are, are you talking about the NCNC range as a property? Uh, say again? Are, we, are, you taking, are you talking about the NCNC range? Because there is something called number concentration range. Um, I'm not sure. NC, I mean, numeric concentration range? Yeah. yeah. That was a set. Sorry, if I could clarify. That was a set of codes we created last year or the year before. I can't yeah. remember. It was a. It was yes, yes. It, it, that that would, co would cover that. That was one of the ones that we wrestled over. And there's some of these things that are, um, are actually uh, logarithmic, uh, but might also be <laughs> considered that way, but I hadn't thought about that very much. We, ha we have a question online, um, Clem. Do you mean like D-dimer where ranges also equate to the categories of low risk, medium risk, et cetera? Well, I think stuff that's done by clinical experts is not in the domain. These are, but it might be. I, I don't know. I don't know lab The D dimers are mostly continuous numbers, my my experience. And there's cutoffs, but that's an interpretation cutoff, not a reporting cutoff. And then we have someone else that says, in their experience, as a mapper, the semi-quantitative de designation on a test has always been hard to map in LOINC. So a definitive category would help. We have defined the semi-quantitative as a test that is based on cutoff quantitative measurement, which is what makes it semi-quantitative, semi in quotes. Well, I think that yeah, the trouble with, I, I, I agree with that we need to make it easier. 
but just simply having one cutoff, I wouldn't call it semi-quantitative. No one does. Labs don't call their, you know, their anybody tests semi-quantitative. It's just, yes, you know, detected, not detected. And it, they call them qualitative. But, you know, deep inside, if you kind of got inside of the machine, you're going to see some kind of a continuous scale. But that's hidden to us. So I don't think we can call those semi-quantitative. Just that'll be mixing it up with qualitatives. But I, I agree that the ones that have numeric steps are, would mostly be semi-quantitative. And that would, should cover the things that the package inserts call semi-quantitative. That's the part we need to resolve. Um, and I think if we could get deep engagement with folks from, uh, and I've tried this though, with folks from the regulatory side, it, we, could, we could clean it up. But it's always somewhat vague and fluffy when, I, when we try to nail them in the past. Uh, Clem, I, I agree with you that there is a need for this because it's clearly different than detected, not detected, or positive, negative, versus yeah. one that gives a, a numerical value. It does make sense to give a third category for these semi-quantitative that just give like one plus, two plus, or a buckets of ranges. Well, well, in the one plus, two plus, I wouldn't make semi-quantitative because there's no numbers on the boundaries. But maybe that's arguable. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I guess I got encouragement to kind of proceed and try to maybe we get engaged with some regulatory bodies, we could kind of settle it. Because if, if we could get the ones they call semi-quantitative to line up with an, an operational, easy operational definition. And those folks who spoke up, if you could send me emails, give me more background, or send swap me emails where we could kind of make a case for this and being clear on how we, we need a nice operational definition is what we need. So, so Clem, Clem, I guess we'd, we'd, go, we'd go back and, and look at existing long terms that are ordinals and maybe look at the answer lists to try to tease well, out which I, ones to I change. Wouldn't, or, I wouldn't start working until we get sort of yeah. agreement, but um, I think there's a handful that have come up that I've thought were been semi-quantitative mm -hmm. in the past. But yeah, you could find it in answer lists that were ranges with numbers on each end. It would be easy. So it all Clem, goes well. I have an example of a semi-quantitative product that is described as a semi-quantitative things in the uh, FDA cleared package inserts. And it says it will give report semi-quantitative result with bins representing 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, uh, genome copy per, et cetera. So it's really reported as being a semi-quant thing. Well, well, what we probably really need is a large sample of those package inserts for those products that are defined as semi-quantitative to see if, if they all fit into this thing. That would be super. I don't know if you could send me some of yours. We could stir up some from other companies. I will. I will send you this. Thank you. Yeah, then because if we could get it to align with the, with the regulatory definition, then the world would be happy. The, the one I will send you I, have passed the FDA inspections. So I will, I will do this for you. Okay, super. Well, I think that's all we can really probably accomplish with it, but I, I, I'm taking it as encouragement and we have to kind of define, end up with a rule that kind of works uh, if, if, and if we can. And I think the regulatory side is a really important side because they use the word in the package inserts. We do have Anna Sossman on the line from the FDA and I do believe she's yes. able to speak now. Yes, okay. Um... I'm listening on and off, uh, very interested in everything that you are saying. I work at the FDA, I work as an analyst. I am a clean, board certified clinical pathologist and now uh, also a fellow of uh, AMIA. Then I have uh, I think that I have a lot, I implemented safety data mining many years ago then. I feel like the problem um, with laboratory data is, uh, is something that is super, super, super complex. Um, I, uh, we start with the pain agency like a CMS that doesn't force interoperability, although they talk about interoperability. Um, 
laboratory results get to the end users damaged. We need to face that they get damaged. Values that are 2.555 become 2,555. And then uh, an organ of a patient, nor a normal organ is removed. And, and uh, the, the board of uh, uh, pathologists interested, they gave a course that was quite uh, insulting on how to avoid litigation instead of, you know, to tell the patient and the family, oh, we made a mistake and so on. Um, uh, but it, it, we are facing uh, what some people call a wicked problem because we are trying to fix it, but we don't understand the whole picture. Well, I'm have to, I have another meeting back at NIH. I'm yes. sorry, I have to leave. And, but I, I, I'm glad to hear the feedback and I think it's clearer some of the information we have to gather. And Andrea, I saw your comment and yes, it would fit those things, like the you know the one to five white cells, that kind of stuff, pretty well. So, uh, sorry, I'm not. I know I'm a little early getting out, but I couldn't uh, avoid this other meeting. Thank Sounds you. Sounds like we'll move it to the November nineteenth uh, telecon then. Yeah. If well, we can I don't get know if some we'll more get examples. I don't know if we'll have an answer by then. I mean, we need to gather some. Inf we need to gather. If, if we get a couple more companies, we should talk to. Roche and others uh, and Abbott, if we could get their package inserts for semi-quantitative things, if we could get coherence across these different uh, tactics of making a definition, we, we'd be in good shape. But I think well, we need that information. It, it, so. uh, Dr. You, McDonald, it, okay, maybe we should have a conversation between the two of us. Hate to eat and run. Yeah, and Clem, I'll email you some veterinary um, use cases that I think apply as well. Okay, super. Thank you, Michael. All right, again, I, I feel like I'm eating and running, but so Thanks bye. Thanks for your time, Clem. It's good to hear you. Thank you. So are we ready for um, Michael to present? Yep. Yes, and we've also proponed sorry, hope not. Yeah, promoted uh, Steve to uh, presenter as well, or panelist, rather. Oh, great. Thanks. Um, I asked for a little bit of time because I think this is a really interesting project taking place down in, in Australia. Um, a, the company VetDB that Steve is the, the CEO of has taken their um, animal identification system, which to my disgrace, the U.S. is behind the rest of the world on, um, that uses an ISO standard um, identifier number, and generally those are carried on RFID. Anyway, they've, they've created a system that links various animal medical records to that identifier and then is, is able to make that easier to share between um, veterinary practices, veterinary labs, and so on. Um, so that's the, the basic infrastructure that, that they've created, and, and I'm extremely jealous of that. Um, because of what we're dealing with in our veterinary world up here. Um, but the, the piece that made me think maybe we ought to come to this committee is they're working on a project to, um, to like code their, their veterinary labs and use that as the connector with the, the clinic um, ordering applications and resulting applications and so on. Um, again, all linked into the, the animal records and one of the, the neat things they're doing is using, um, no, I don't, I don't have slides. Um, one of the, I, I should have, but I apologize. Um, one of the, the neat things they're doing is, and this is what my slide would be, is some pictures of the barcodes that come on some of the specimen tubes that they're using include embedded in the in the unique identifier a code that identifies the the type of specimen um, so is it a um, so is it a um, clot tube is it a, a serum tube is it a, a whole blood tube with edta and so on 
And by, oh, very good. Uh, thank you, Steve. <laughs> it's all right, I'll do this in the background for you. Cool. Um, yeah, so these tubes, if they, if they program their system correctly, as they put the LOINC code in, it can say, is this an appropriate specimen for the test that we're ordering? And so it's that linkage between the, the barcode, the barcoded specimen type and the LOINC code that, that they're using to um, facilitate the ordering process. And what he came to me with was a question, is there a standard or should there be a standard for those barcodes? And if not, should LOINC create it? I was fairly confident when I said that would not be in LOINC's wheelhouse, but I also felt like this committee probably has the people who are the experts and could help direct us to, to the right place to ask the questions like that. Um, have I missed any of the, the key points, Steve? Uh, not at all, except for just one of the companies being GBO out of Austria have thought a few steps ahead. So they are the um, tubes, that's the tube on the bottom. So the code starts with the DN3J1. That indicates the volume and the type of tube for GBO. And then the A04ME is just the random piece of text that comes with it to make it unique. So for GBO, they're, they're thinking ahead, whereas the other provider in the middle there, that's just completely random and unique to them. So um, if we're going to, you know, obviously all these suppliers are starting to recognize the value of a unique coded system, but if they all have their own system, then it's kind of just all over the place. Whereas if they follow some sort of format, it would be very helpful. Hey Mike, thank you for sharing. Um, I'll, I'll mention that HL7 has the specimen dam or domain analysis model. And there's also fire resources and um, the specimen calls that are usually on Mondays um, do take up specimen needs. Um, we haven't gotten into the barcoding specifically um, as far as I'm aware, but there's a number of folks that are focused on the specimen needs and reporting and all the informatics around that, if that helps. Yeah, this Rob McClure, I think Andrew's in the right place. I think that, that I mean, I'm, I'm wondering what's the link question here, to be honest. And um, not, it's not to say that there's that it doesn't sound like there's some real value in having a a standard and I and I kind of follow that with this that last um, tube example where you say that the dn 3 j one has has some meaning is that meaning standardized or is that meaning just for that vendor just for that vendor as I understand and if I could kind of bridge the gap here is that the way I understand the LOINC value here is it, it's at the patient side in terms of the request, and then it's at the lab side in terms of the tests and orders that's being done. But the middle part, the, the transport part or the tube part is completely offline. And by having a standardized format for the tubes, you could match the compatibility with the LOINC test to be done. So you could have instant feedback that you have enough blood or the correct tubes for the LOINC tests that are requested. Yeah, I, so, and, and, and it's an absolutely, okay, so that, it is an absolutely reasonable request. You're asking for a standard, and I think that that's a really valuable and important request. And then the question is, who can meet your need? And, and that's where I think the question is, is LOINC the right place? I suspect LOINC could be a place, but um, I think I agree with Andrea that there's no question that another place that is focused on this right now would be HL7. And it absolutely would be reasonable to suggest crafting a standard perhaps aligned with that last vendor so that there's consistency where appropriate and HL7 could deliver that. Okay, great, thank you. Here's a side thought, um, you know, we're gonna hear, I mean, not that I'm trying to plug my talk coming up, but you know, mapping of LOINC parts to, you know, external things is part of the topic. And, um, 
you know, I'm just, just thinking that, you know, it would be Loink system parts could be mapped if there were a standard, you know, that was well established for tubes that collect, say, serum versus plasma versus urine, um, you know, then those mappings could be, could be stored. Um, I absolutely related, agree. Uh, yeah, that's that's where this would go. Exactly yeah. right. Another aspect too is SNOMED does have um, codes and, and John Snyder might want to jump in here, but if you're looking at additives like EDTA in a tube, like for purple top, et cetera, mm -hmm. um, those are in SNOMED as well. And I think they also have certain containers. Um, we started some work on that, um, but haven't finished that in one of the lab calls too. But then you've got the whole SNOMED problem. <laughs> yeah. and I think, I think that, that um, this is a very, very reasonable request. And, um, and I think what, I, what you're hearing from me and from Andrea is, is that there's a group already working in this space that could deliver on the needs, and then it could be linked into LOINC. Right. And, yep. Rob, if I can just add in, this is John Snyder. So uh, we do have some options on the SNOMED side, which would be potentially the veterinary extension that's being managed out of Virginia Tech. Um, if these tubes are truly specific to veterinary medicine as opposed to human medicine, it may be appropriate to add them to that extension, which may ease some of the SNOMED licensing issues. Um, yeah, but this is going to be, you, you know, I can tell you that the HL7 community, I hear that and I appreciate it, but we want to solve this for any specimen, I, not just vets. I, I agree. The only concern I have with the point of using the link parts goes back to what was discussed yesterday about the meeting that there is a certain degree of volatility currently uh, that can come into the link parts. So I think if we're going to start using them as a standard, then we have to decrease some of that volatility. I, I think these wouldn't, I wouldn't view it as using the link parts as a standard because that, that is something that we really don't suggest, but it would be a way of linking, you know, link parts already have linkages to external things like in, you know, Radlex and RX Norm and Snowman and, and those linkages are used to help in providing some, you know, semantics or n knowledge to the link terms that use those parts. And so, you know, it would, it would be a way of connecting fully specified link terms via their part to a code for a specimen, you know, external, you know, that, an external code, coded specimen type. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think that kind of use, as long as the part is related to a link, is is where we would see it being used. Not so much using the link parts as a as a terminology of of themselves. Right. Well, is there any other conversations that need to take place today? We're we got five minutes or so. That's oh. that's a record for us, isn't it, Sonia? <laughs> yeah. So, Pam, I think we were actually going to open it up just for oh. any committee members who wanted to give updates real quick. I realize now we only have five minutes, but um, I, I think Dr. Yao definitely wanted to give an update, and then I don't think we heard back from anybody else. But you're you know you're welcome to. And thank you, committee, for the guidance on this on the tubes thing. That was very, very helpful to me, and I hope it was to Steve. Yes, it was. Thank you very much. Sorry, I wasn't sure whether <laughs> you were still planning to go on. So I, I just need to pull up the slide. I have eight slides uh, that should go pretty quickly within five minutes. Okay, yeah, and sorry about that. We, no problem. We always can, tend to run out of time. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Okay, all right. Um, I think since I presented our mapping effort almost two years ago or a year and a half ago, uh, we have made great progress in our orderable uh, lab tests. You can see that the uh, apple green 
Pi has grown from 50% to uh, 63. In fact, before the COVID situation, we were actually up to almost 75, 80%. But the uh, COVID uh, personnel constraint put us back a bit. Uh, we still have quite a sizable, almost 25% a quarter of our test uh, orders are actually meant for internal operation purposes, not for ordering. Um, so it's kind of like reflex tests that triggers for billing purposes. That's why they're no longer needed. Um, the outside send out tests, uh, they're getting better. So almost 70% of our referral tests do have loin orderables attached to them. Um, we still have a sizable 30% where the outside performing lab don't give us the orderable loin codes. For the resultables, uh, we're doing much better. We're almost 95% mapped for all our results uh, that we reported out. Uh, a small percentage are bill only, for example that we don't uh, have LOINC. So total, the when you add up the blue and the brown, it's around 5%. Now, interestingly, for the send out referral tests, they're much better with resultables. Uh, you recall from the orderable, they're around 70%, but for resultable, they're 82% uh, that we do get uh, LOINC codes, still around 15%, uh, no resultable LOINC from the outside labs. Now COVID uh, since March uh, has thrown a wrench into our <laughs> LOINC mapping effort. Uh, to date, we have launched 17 out of 19 new tests just for COVID-19 testing. Uh, the blue you see are the molecular tests and the uh, kind of orange brown is actually serologic tests. As many of my colleagues in the lab know that uh, there's severe supply and reagent constraints from all the manufacturers. So in order to meet the demand of our internal and reference lab client practice, uh, we just could not have enough reagents and supply from one assay. That's why rapidly within um, the first case reported in the US, we almost have two to three new tests launched every month to meet the clinical demands. We have developed some uh, LDTs uh, that have gone through FDA, EUA, but we also have developed tests that are strictly for research use only, such as dry blood spots, uh, and also a quantitative um, LDT uh, based on an RUO assay using digital PCR method. Um, you know, with now with the flu season coming on, uh, we're also launching the combination assay for SARS-CoV-2 plus flu AB and also RSV. So total by the end of this year will be 19 tests and we have two more tests, uh, three more tests to launch in November. Uh, just to share with the group what our test volume has been. So this is from the CDC website. You can see that from um, mid-March we had Three, two peaks, probably maybe three peaks. Um, and they're all, the second peak is related to July 4th. Uh, Americans just love vacations and family gathering. So we may see a third peak with Thanksgiving if they don't follow Dr. Fauci's uh, recommendation <laughs> to stay home. And this is our volume here at uh, Mayo Medical Laboratories. This is a cumulative so we are almost 2 million by the end of this month. It's currently at 190, 190 sorry, uh, 1 million 950,000 tests so far. So probably uh, we'll reach 2 million by the end of this month from the beginning of the pandemic. And you can see that the positivity rate is indicated by the uh, orange uh, bar. This is our average daily positivity. So at the beginning of the pandemic, um, of course, this is very client bias and specific. We were up to almost 13% positivity. And then since June, we have flattened out to average about five to 6% uh, positivity. And our volume, test volume also 
has kind of slowed down as well. So it's not an exponential uh, increase. Where are our clients? So if you look at the CDC map where all the positivity, the darker the color, the higher the number of cases per 100,000. So uh, this is of course a client referral uh, bias. Um, you can see that we're not as many clients on the West as compared to the East. And then the uh, orange pie chart uh, are the positivity rates. So we had uh, folks mainly in the West, the East region of the Mississippi. And Alaska uh, also has uh, some clients for us out there. Um, not to be outdone by molecular tests, we've also seen serologic tests, although it's around one-tenth of our current volume for molecular tests. So we are around 250,000 tests we have performed. The positivity rate is only around 10%. Um, so we are not really that uh, immune yet in the population. So certainly herd immunity will not work for the U.S. Um, we have ongoing challenges and constraints. Um, almost 50% of our IT personnel was on furlough for first five months of the pandemic. And we've also lost 90% of all our contract IT employees. Um, and of course, government makes sometimes make our lives miserable by requiring us to report out these demographics that we have no way of getting because we are a reference lab. All we get is the patient's name, date of birth, and gender. We don't have uh, patient's um, ethnicity or occupation or even their address because our clients are not patients. Our clients are hospital laboratories or clinics. Um, so currently we are complying with the 18 musts data elements for our own internal practice. Uh, and then there are these 17 should that we are totally not able to comply with the reporting to the local health authorities. Um, of course, you know, the number of new tests that we have to launch to meet the clinical practice that always puts a burden on our um, staff. We currently have one and a half FTE for our loin mapping effort for all our laboratory tests. Uh, as a result of this, we also have put on hold our planned HL7 upgrade to version 2.5.1. We're not sure when that will happen, but hopefully we can pick this back up in 2021. That's all I have, Swapna. Great. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. Um, and just, you know, seeing all the numbers and the trends. Um, I feel like that's something that we, at least from the long side, don't get to see very often, um, you know, at a specific lab level. So that was really super interesting. Um, so I think we're actually out of time. We went a little bit over. So um, apologies, I guess, if anybody else wanted to give an update. Um, but if you're going to be on uh, tomorrow during the clinical committee meeting, maybe we could do some updates then for anybody who's interested. Um, all right. So I guess uh, we will go ahead and end this meeting and then we will see you in 10 minutes uh, if you've signed up for the workshops and then otherwise we'll see you tomorrow uh, for the committee meeting. So thank you very much. <laughs>